Okay, Maggie is an assistant digital projects and preservation archivist for the Washington State Archives. And she's going to explain to us today how to preserve oversized items. A lot of us end up with things like this that have been passed down in the family and they don't just neatly fit in things that we might have. And yet we know it's not a good idea to fold it or roll it up. So she's gonna to explain to us what we should be doing. Thank you very much, Maggie. You're welcome. Thank you everyone for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys today about this. Um, so I'm gonna be going over some preservation problems that are inherent to oversized records. Um, I'm also gonna talk about the best ways to store them to sort of mitigate some of those issues um, and some basic preservation and mild conservation methods you can use to, to take care of your records if they are, if, um, if there is any problems or if they're experiencing any sort of degradation. Um, Let's see, I'm gonna demonstrate some storage methods that are good for them in your home. Um, and then I'll answer some questions at the end if you have them. So I think maybe the best way to do that would be to put your questions in the chat box and then we can kind of look through them at the end and I'll answer them as we go. Um, all right, so I'm gonna try and share my screen here so you can see my presentation. All right. Okay, so um, what is an oversized record? Um, I think it's anything that is larger than eight and a half by 14, um, because then once it's that size, it will no longer easily fit into a standard size box. Um, oversized records could be posters, they can be maps, they can be architectural drawings or blueprints, um, panoramas, certificates, artwork, um, register books, or large volumes or scrapbooks are all considered oversized materials. So some of the problems that are um, inherent to oversized materials include um, acidic paper. Um, since the early 19th century, most papers were made with a wood pulp slurry, um, which contained the lignin that binds the fibers together. Wood pulp papers replaced cotton rag in the 19th century. Um, the lignin oxidizes as the paper is exposed to light, um, and that can make the paper look yellow. It can also cause the paper to become fragile or brittle. Uh, newspapers in particular are notorious for this. Um, handmade papers were usually okay, um, and you can differentiate um, fiber, uh, wood-based papers versus um, uh, fabric-based papers uh, by their watermarks and lines. Um, items backed with linen or muslin. Uh, sometimes the material is um, impregnated with a starch that can make it look um, they can give it a hard surface. Um, and in this case, moisture can dissolve and the starch can cause rippling. So you'll see that on the image on the right hand side where this was a map that was placed on top of a, um, a muslin background. And over time, that's, that's caused some problems for, for the map on top of it. Um, the varnish and shellac shellacking over maps. Um, sometimes maps were varnished as a pr protective treatment, um, which was also done, this was also done to globes as well. Um, but the varnish yellows as it ages due to oxidation, um, and the more exposure to light it has, the darker it gets. And the varnish, varnish can cause cracking and will usually need conservation. So um, the less light it's, it's, it's exposed to, the better. So other problems, um, transparent papers. Um, so these can be tracing papers, vellum papers, or, um, or a vegetable parchment. Um, these have a variety of issues depending on the methods that were used to make it. And they tend to be pretty brittle and fragile um, and deteriorate quickly over time. And oftentimes they have a plastic coating. Um, plastic coating, um, also known as uh, PVC material, which is polyvinyl chloride. Um, it has a chlorine gas 
it releases a chlorine gas as it ages, and this can cause the plastic to break down. Um, and sometimes it becomes sort of gooey and brittle. Um, animal skin, so animal skin is often called parchment or vellum. Um, parchment was usually made from calf or goat or sheep, um, and vellum was usually only made from the calf skin. Um, it is not used much currently, um, but it was popular uh, for many years um, for older documents and diplomas. Um, Animal skins struggle with humidity um, and water usually causes lots of problems um, that, that can't be easily treated. Um, so you would, if you have any, if you do suspect you have an animal skin document, um, you would wanna consult with a conservator about how to properly um, preserve it. Um, contemporary parchment um, is made from a cellulose fiber like trees or cotton or flax. Uh -huh. So ink, um, inks tend to fade uh, due to light, heat, or moisture. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a map that um, existed prior to the 1800, 1800s, um, they were primarily used oil-based and they're relatively stable. Um, maps that are older than, than that, or if they're after the 1800s, they use oil-based ink, sorry, and they, they're relatively stable. Maps that are older than that um, can have manuscript ink, um, which can include iron gall ink, which is highly acidic. Um, high humidity will deteriorate iron gall inks over time. Um, and the iron gall, because it is so um, high in acid, will eat through paper, which is what you're seeing there on the left. Um, this would require preservation or conservation work to, to fix. Um, and we, if you have something that's this old, we would highly recommend creating a digital surrogate um, as soon as possible to capture what you have on the record before, um, before the ink really does damage. Um, another thing that we often come across with oversized items are poor repairs. Um, so that would include people putting things like tapes or glues on the record. Um, glues have a tendency to um, sink through the pages and that can accelerate um, acid degradation. It also stains the paper and, 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 it, and it doesn't always last. So sometimes people will put tape on there that's not an, a preservation tape or an archival tape. Um, it'll dry up over time and it will start to fall off. And um, so you'll end up with a stained document um, that is no longer being held together. So it will need um, conservation. And folding, I think we probably, this is probably the most common. Lots of things are folded. Um, mechanical folding, um, it weakens the paper and it, and it has a tendency to break and cause rips over time along the folds. Um, so folding maps and things, um, once, you, if you, once, once you realize that it's, it's good to keep it unfolded, you'll wanna make sure you have a place to put it you know, once you've done that. So, we suggest avoiding, you know, opening and closing it often because doing that will will make the problem worse. Um, if you're not ready to store it in a in a in a location where it can be flat, um, just keep it folded and try not to open it too much. All right, so I'm going to talk about some poor storage. Um, these are things that we see often. Um, rolled and vertical records. When you when you roll something, obviously it's it's going to need to be unrolled over time, and that that can also. I'm going to talk a little bit how to unroll things, but um, storing them vertically places pressure on the edges of the item. So if you'll see on the left hand side, these records have been stored vertically and rolled for many years, and they've started to. Um, they started to rip along the edges and they're sort of getting smashed and they'll eventually start to disintegrate and fall apart. Um, we also see hanging files. So if you hang something that, that sort of just puts stress on specific points um, and doesn't provide much support. So we don't usually recommend hanging. Um, overcrowding can warp um, the, the document from the weight. 
Um, as you'll see on the right hand side here, we have a group of um, a set of maps that's overcrowded. Um, there's like smaller sized maps underneath and larger sized maps on top. And you'll see that it's sort of distorted the maps on top and um, it's causing some problems. So overcrowding is an issue. You wanna make sure that you um, don't put too many documents together in a single location. Um, cutting and sectioning. So oftentimes, um, this is pretty common when, especially with, um, uh, especially for use in, in scrapbooks and things. Um, cutting an oversized item for um, storage, um, they would often, um, it, it allows you to mount them together. Um, and sometimes what they would do is they would cut the image and then they would um, put like a single piece of cloth between the gaps so that the sections could be folded easily into a scrapbook. Um, uh, obviously this isn't great. This is the example that I have here on the right was from one of our collection. Um, what we ended up doing here was removing the object, the image <clears throat> from the scrapbook page. Um, and then of course making a notation of, you know, what was there originally and having a, a digital surrogate. Um, but then we stored that, um, that oversized photograph flat in a large box so that it no longer needs to be folded. Um, lamination. So sometimes you'll see um, oversized records that have been laminated. The problem with lamination is that um, it is made of a plastic material that can shrink over time and that will warp your document underneath. Um, and the folding that you'll see here also damages the paper. Same as newspapers, they're only meant to be folded once um, and should not be folded a second time. Like I said, that you know the opening and the closing of folded items can cause tearing. Um, and they will easily break. So, um, so don't unfold anything until you know you have a place to store it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some good storage environments for oversized records. Uh, firstly, minimizing exposure to light. Um, light accelerates deterioration and leads to brittle fibers that can cause papers to bleach, yellow, or darken. And it also causes dyes to fade or change color, um, altering the legibility of the record. Any exposure to light, even for a brief time, is damaging um, because light damage is cumulative and it is irreversible. So it's not something that can be fixed uh, by a conservator or an archivist. Using boxes or enclosures uh, that prevent light from, um, prevent the document from being exposed to light is the best option. Uh, the next is a stable temperature. So you'll want to keep your records in a place that has a temperature no higher than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So somewhere between 55 and 70 is good. Um, and a stable relative humidity between 30 and 50 percent. Um, a lower relative humidity is, of course, best. Um, because it um, deterioration progresses at a slower rate at a colder temperature. Um, items expanding and contracting from dramatic temperatures um, pose a high risk. So, ten, you know, so don't keep your records in uh, an attic or a basement or anywhere where there's going to be lots of temperature fluctuations. Um, anywhere where you store your records, make sure that they are clean and um, dust free pollutants um, can cause harmful chemical reactions that lead to the formation of acids in materials. And this is a serious problem for paper and leather in particular. Uh, paper will become discolored and brittle and leather becomes weak and powdery if it's exposed to um, these particulates. Um, soot can abrade and disfigure materials as well. So make sure again, store them in a clean place away from chemicals. Um, definitely not in a garage where cars are kept. Um, and store away from food, water, or damp. Um, records that um, are, are close to garbage cans or water, or you know, sometimes we'll see that you know records will be stored under leaky pipes, or um, you know, of course in a basement um, where it's oftentimes damp. Um, and these these environments just attract pests who like to eat paper. 
So one of the best places to to keep your your records is actually in um, uh, is in a, a closet in the middle of your house. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Uh, the closets in the center of your house are usually stay at a, a an even temperature, um, and they're not usually exposed to light. So other good options are map cases. Um, map cases are made of chemically stable materials. Um, they are they have solvent free powder coatings or anodized aluminum. Um, if you have a wood map case, you can line it with a polyester film or a floor a four ply rag board, um, and that'll help to seal the wood with a polyurethane coating. Um, so the examples we have here, the the picture on the left is actually from our collection. Um, that's how we store maps, um, and then the picture on the right is actually from my house or my my last house, um, and I used to keep my map collection in. Um, in this map case in my living room. And so it, it doubled as a coffee table and a great place to store my maps and art prints. Um, so protective enclosures, um, these include boxes or folders. Um, enclosures are great and they can protect your records from light. They can protect them from temperature and humidity fluctuations. Um, the leaks and any sort of drinks getting knocked over while you're working on them. Um, boxes, um, objects larger than 15 by 9 inches should be stored flat. Um, boxes can be made up to 30 by 40 inches. Um, and I know that there are some companies that, you know, they can make custom boxes for you, um, but it does get pricey as, as you go up. So you'll want to make sure that it's something that, you know, is really worth the cost. Um, Boxes should be buffered um, and lignin free with lids. Um, uh, but I'm going to explain buffered and unbuffered. I'm going to talk about unbuffered and buffered a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to explain them to you now. Um, the difference between buffered and unbuffered is their pH level. Buffered papers or enclosures have a pH that is slightly above neutral, um, which is at 7 pH. Yeah making it more alkaline. Unbuffered papers and boxes are neutral. And there is a lot of information about these online. So if you have any, if there's any confusion about it, you can either email me or you can, you know, check the internet. There's, there's um, some good resources out there about that. Um, folders are the least expensive storage enclosure. Um, they're good for acidic items. They should be acid and lignin free um, and buffered for most paper artifacts. Blueprints are the, except, are the exception um, and they're the only ones that really should be stored in an unbuffered folder. Um, because blueprints are meant to be slightly acidic and you don't want the folders to neutralize the materials or the, the inks on the blueprints. Um, Folders should be somewhat larger than the sheet size. So you'll see on the example on the right here, you'll want to have a nice, some nice spacing around the object that's in the folder so you don't have a situation where the object is poking out um, because that can cause deterioration along the edges of your object. Um, if you need to interleave multiple items in a folder, we recommend using an acid-free tissue or paper um, interleaved between each item. Um, so that just prevents acid migration from one record to the other. Um, so especially if you have something like a newspaper article or a clipping in the same folder as a poster or another document, um, the acid in the newspaper tends to travel. So you, so putting those, interleaving those tissue papers between them will prevent that. Um, and so just as a reminder, I put um, here that buffered um, is good for newspapers, acidic paper, black and white photos and negatives, um, and anything made of cotton or linen. Unbuffered um, is preferred for blueprints, color photos and negatives, leather or silk, or anything that is animal, de animal derived. Also, if you need to store things in a folder, um, do not overcrowd. So you'll want to keep it to less than 12, 12 items per folder, depending on you know, their size.
Uh, so polyester film encapsulation. Um, this is a good option if the items in your collection are fragile or frequently handled. Um, the electrostatic charge can hold the paper fragments in alignment as well. Um, this is not suitable for acidic objects as the encapsulation can actually trap the acid. Um, it's also not good for um, powdery media such as charcoal, soft pencil, or any sort of flaking paint. Um, the static from the poly can dislodge the media, so, so try to avoid, you'll, you'll want to avoid that. Um, you can back acidic materials with a buffered paper if you do need to put them in a mylar. Um, encapsulation will not slow the progress of acid deterioration. Um, in order to do that, you will need to add buffered paper around the object. Um, so as I said before, the buffered paper has a slightly higher pH that is above neutral, and that helps neutralize acidic objects such as newspaper, um, which can deteriorate really pretty quickly. Um, so, but we don't recommend using it, <clears throat> or to be careful with using it, um, buffer papers on materials that are meant to have a more acidic composition, such as um, animal-derived um, objects or color photographs, because neutralizing these things could, um, could actually cause damage. Okay, so here's an example of um, encapsulation. Um, Encapsulation is not lamination. Um, lamination uh, is a process that, by which it's, it's an actual sticky material that is adhering to the object it, itself. Um, encapsulation just creates a pocket. Um, polyester, um, which includes mylar or melanix, polypropylene, polyethylene are all generally acceptable plastics. Um, that must be free of external plasticizers, surface coatings, or UV inhibitors. Um, and you can make an encapsulator yourself. Um, so as you'll see here, you'll want to select two, select and cut two sheets of polyester film um, that are at least one and a half inches larger than the object to be encapsulated, um, and using a weight to hold it down in the center, and apply some double-sided tape along the three edges of the polyester film. Um, and leave the backing on the, on the tape until <clears throat> you're ready to um, encapsulate. Um, we recommend using a 3M number four, 415 double-sided polyester transparent tape coated with an acrylic adhesive. Um, at this point, you'll place the paper object within the tape boundaries and make sure that the object does not touch the tape. Um, and then you'll lay the second piece of film over the object and align with all edges um, and place, uh, place the weight within the center to keep everything from slipping. Um, and then you'll lift one end of the polyester film to remove the tape backing from the double-sided tape and then they'll lay the poly back over the tape. So you'll create a little sealed pocket. And then you can use a cotton um, to gently press uh, like a cotton cloth to gently press in the direction the film is closing. And I, when we did this, um, when we did this presentation um, here at the archives, we actually gave this as a handout, but um, you can see the link below. Um, the NPS Sokov is the National Park Service. They actually have a lot of good resources on how to do preservation. Um, so you'll find that this, um, um, this illustration there. Um, just a little bit of terminology since I'm throwing out a lot of words here before we move on. Um, archival means there is no standard or legal definition for the word archival. Manufacturers um, often use this word to their um, in their advertising regardless of the quantity or the quality of their products. So so even so just to keep an eye out for, you know, if it does say that it's archival, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Um, the more important words you'll want to look for are things like acid free. Um, acid free means that the um, the enclosure has a neutral pH at the time of manufacture, um, but it can become more acidic over time. Uh, lignin free is another word to look for um, when you're when you're researching boxes or folders. 
Um, lignin, as I said before, is an acid found in the wood pulp slurry used to create paper. Um, and over time, it does break down and can cause paper to turn yellow and become brittle. And just to review again, buffered. Um, buffered mean is made with an alkaline reserve or calcium carbonate that neutralizes acid and minimizes the chance of acid migration in your records. So um, it's good when used with plant-based materials, not animal-derived records. Unbuffered um, is non-alkaline. And like I said, it's best used with protein-based materials. Something you'll also wanna keep an eye out for is whether or not it has passed um, your enclosure or your folder um, has passed the PAT test. Um, and PAT, let me see if I can remember here, stands for, um, where did it go? Hold on, I lost my notes here, just a minute. Oh, the photographic activity test, pardon me. Um, so it means that it's gone through, um, they have actually tested this and it's evaluated and it has, um, it evaluates possible chemical interactions between enclosures and photographs after a long-term storage. Um, so you, so this is one of the most important things to look for is whether or not your enclosures have passed the PAT test. Okay, another good way to store your records um, is by rolling. Um, I know this seems counter to what I said earlier, but there are proper ways to roll your records. Um, and this is good for items that are too large um, to store in boxes or cabinets. Um, generally, the, um, the tube that you use to roll your record into should be lignin-free. Um, that's at least four inches in diameter. So the, um, the diameter of your roll is, does, does help to prevent, uh, to prevent damage. So the larger the roll, the better. Um, the tube should extend beyond the sheets by at least two inches at each end. Um, Non-archival tubes can be covered with a barrier sheet of like polyester film um, that's wrapped around the tube to secure, um, that's, that's placed on the inside. Um, and, then, and then secured with a double-sided tape underneath the poly. Um, let's see. So if you don't, if you're not able to use a tube, you can also um, roll the object on its own using um, archival paper. So you can cover the front side of your document with archival paper and roll the front side towards the tube and then wrap it in archival quality paper or polyester film to protect against abrasion or dust or pollutants. Um, if you do it this way, you'll wanna secure it with you know, a, um, an undyed fabric. Um, or tape, an archival tape, and store horizontally. Um, obviously, we prefer that you don't use rubber bands because rubber bands tend to harden and become brittle over time, and they can also stain your records as well. And they sometimes also become sticky, so then you'll have an issue where rubber bands have, are sticking to your object. So use an undyed fabric to tie up your rolled item. Um, and you can also use polyester. So use a four to five mil polyester film um, and place the object inside. Oh, so I'm looking at my notes here. Yeah, so you can use a polyester film to roll with your object to, um, to prevent any sort of acid migration. Um, unfortunately, I didn't put a photograph here of the process we use, but basically it's you know, you have your object and then you'll have an archival paper underneath and then you'll put maybe a polyester on top. So you're creating sort of a sandwich and then you're doing a roll. So proper handling of oversized records, um, you'll grab um, on the diagonal and, um, or you can also, so grabbing on the diagonal if it's a looser item, you can also use a flat support underneath um, 
to move it safely. Um, another option is to have two people work together, as you'll see here. <laughs> So some minor preservation and conservation work you can do on your records um, firstly involves removing grommets and staples. Um, grommets and staples can abrade surfaces and leave rust. Um, as we know, mess, metal tends to corrode as it's exposed to oxygen or sulfur. Um, metal produces an oxide or ox, produces oxide or salt, which results in an orange sort of coloration. So remove grommets and staples or any sort of metal. Um, anything that's keeping the, the records together with metal uh, as soon as possible. Um, document cleaning pads and cloth bags filled with eraser crumbs. Um, residue from the crumbs can become trapped in the paper visor, paper visors and be abrasive, so be careful when using those. Um, but these can be used to clean mold off of documents. Um, sponge erasers are vulcanized rubber. These are a good choice for cleaning torn when cleaning torn areas, you just want to move in the direction of the tear um, and try to avoid purchasing sort of chemical sponges. Just sponge erasers are the best. Um, you can also use a vacuum with a HEPA, HEPA filter um, as long as you put a nylon stocking over the hose to protect the document. Um, this is a good way to, to clean from dust or um, any inactive mold that might be on your record. Um, mending is something that is best left to a conservator, but the best things to use are water moistenable gummed linen tapes um, or a wheat starch paste with um, Japanese tissue. Um, let's see, the wheat starch paste is, also, is called a, a Zen Sofu. Um, And these, both of these are reversible, so that's why they're the best to use. Um, remember to use these things sparingly as introducing moisture can cause um, damage or cockling. We also don't recommend using any sort of pressure sensitive tapes like scotch tape, masking tape, or duct tape. Um, no solvent based adhesives like rubber cement or acrylic cement. These will all cause damage to your records. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to humidify a rolled document. Um, humidifying and flattening rolled records takes up a lot of space, so only do it if you know you have the space to do it. Um, and it can sometimes take a couple of days to fully unroll a record, so just keep that in mind when you start this project that you're going to be occupying that space for some time um, and you'll want to, so you want to avoid moving all this stuff around. Um, humidifying roll documents uh, can be risky, so we do say you're doing this at your own risk. Um, for any records that you're interested in flattening, it's a good idea to contact a conservator first, if only to find out what your object is made of. Um, different coatings and processes, such as for like photographic albumin, gelatin, or collodion processes, can react differently to moisture and can cause um, can have detrimental effects. So make sure you want to know. Um, you'll want to know ahead of time before you humidify. Um, according to the um, National Park Service, paper records such as maps, newspapers, and documents that have been rolled or folded may be safely fat flattened using humidification, um, but humidification is not appropriate for all paper materials. Um, for instance, we do not recommend humidification for paper objects that are of high intrinsic, um, artistic, or associative value. You should always avoid humidifying papers with water soluble media such as watercolors and some inks, um, friable media such as chalk or charcoal or pastels, um, as well as heavily textured media such as oil paint. Um, these will all be damaged by humidification, so do not use um, in those instances. Um, mounted photographs. Um, this can include a photograph that was mounted like a poster board, can have um, can sometimes withstand this project process, but it just depends on how it's attached to the mounting board. Um, humidification can cause wrinkling, cockling, and puck puckering of the photograph. Um, also, the mounting the mounting can 
be distorted as well. Um, it's also not a great process for composites or things like collages where you have one, uh, one piece of paper that's affixed to another. The humidification process can cause um, the object that it, that's affixed to the paper to become loose. Um, so you want to avoid doing that for, for things like collages. Um, hand, anything that's hand colored, um, a surface that has had some sort of surface retouching inscriptions can cause different reactions. So, um, so stick to, so keep this simple. Um, you know, the safe things, like I said before, maps, newspapers, most documents can handle this. Um, and then some, some more modern photographic print processes can handle rehumidification as well. Um, in order to humidify a record, you'll want to use distilled water at least two inches um, in the bottom of a large Tupperware, as you'll see on the left. Um, and then you'll place a rack over the water and you'll make sure, wanna make sure that your rack is not, if, it's, if it is metal, it needs to have some sort of coating on it so that the metal isn't rusting while you're rehumidifying and then causing damage to the records on top of them. Um, you'll place the rack over the water and then put the items on top of the rack, laying them horizontally, and then you'll put on your lid. Um, after a few hours, you'll start to feel the paper soften um, and you'll really, you don't want to leave it too much past this point. You really don't want the records to be, become moist. This is just about making them softer and looser so that you can flatten them. Um, if they're kept in too long, this can alter the image color or appearance. Um, most records will relax in about four to six hours, so, but you'll want to check on these hourly um, so as to avoid over humidification. Um, and you'll know that you've you've over humidified you've humidified it too much because um, the record can become sort of tacky or sticky to the touch. Um, once the items are done, remove them um, and sandwich them between. Um, you'll sort of sandwich them between um, blotting paper or archival rag board, and then lay some weights on top of them. So this is an example um, from ConservationWiki.com. You'll see here we have our sort of object in the middle that's been rehumidified. Um, and then you'll have a smooth board or blotting paper on top, on the top and the bottom. Um, and then on top of the smooth blotting board, you'll have um, a heavier weighted board that's um, not capable of bending. Um, and then on top of those weighted, those heavier weighted boards, you want to put some actual weights. Uh, we like to use um, what are they called? Um, they're sort of like bean bags, but they have rice in them, and they're sort of heavy, and they're good for weighing down things like maps. We put those on top. You can also use books. Anything that will help in in the flattening of the material. Um, so you'll need weights, a flat surface, smooth blotting paper. Smooth or extra smooth, and then your your heavy um, your heavyweight board. Um, and the the smooth boards can leave impressions. Um, let's see what they said here. Um, smooth boards do make impressions, um, or sorry, keep impressions from being made on the photos. Apologies. Um, and smooth boards can be paper boards and mat boards that are 100% cotton. Um, you can also use sort of a polyester webbing. Um, they go by the names Bondina or Hollytex. Rime or Cerex, um, or a silicone release paper between your um, your object and the board um, to protect it from any sort of sticking. And when I say board, I mean the um, the actual smooth board that is that sits on top of your photograph or or document. So another way to um, Flatten objects is doing a slow unroll. Um, the, um, this is sort of an alternative to humidification. Um, as you'll see here, the first um, document is it's in, in its natural state of, un, of curl. Um, after a few weeks, it was placed around a slightly larger tube and then let to rest for a time. Depending on its original condition and size, you may need to do this several times. Um, this, this can take quite a while. Um, 
If the tubes are acidic, you'll want to wrap them in a polyester or acid-free paper first. Um, once the tube diameter is about 50% the size of the document, you may be able to flatten, um, be able to flatten the document. So you'll you'll want to just keep expanding um, until, like I said, it's about 50% of the size, and then it'll be ready to be flattened. Um, if you feel that um, it will not unroll without cracking, um, then you can enroll it. You can continue to just gradually um, add tubes over time to, to make it larger. So you can start with a smaller tube and then get larger. Um, Cause you, um, when records are, when records are already cracking, that means they're pretty brittle. Um, and so you'll, you'll wanna unroll them as slowly as possible. Um, and you're allowing the unrolling to absorb some of the natural humidity in the air. So 50% or great humidity is best. Um, if you live in a mountainous area or a desert area, this might not be a good method for unrolling. Um, yeah, and so if a record is shown, if, it's, if it has a willingness to unroll, that's good. If it appears extremely stiff or brittle, we wouldn't recommend trying this method. Um, if you if you have concerns about doing any of these yourself, we would um, recommend contacting a conservator, and this is the best resource that we know of, the American Institution for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. Um, conservationists can register with this site, and um, you can locate them. Um, you can locate someone to help you in your area through this this link here. Okay, so before I leave, um, I was gonna see if people can unmute themselves for this activity. Um, I was just gonna show you um, some records that we have in our collection and we can talk about um, maybe what's the best approach for handling them. So um, what we have here are some rolled panoramas um, of the machine gun troop B of Tacoma, Murray, Washington in 1921. Um, these were rolled very tightly um, and they are a more modern print, so they would do well with humidification. Um, so it's a little bit different because I used to do this in person, um, but uh, what, how would you handle this? Does anyone have any um, insights based on what we've talked about? Try it first. I would unroll them so that they're not so tight. Yeah. Yeah, so you could humidify these records um, and then you could use the flattening process that we recommended. Um, and once you have them flattened out, um, you would place them in a panoramic box that is uh, buffered because it's a black and white. Who would have a panoramic box? It has to be an archival place. Yes, yeah, so you'll have to, panoramic boxes are available through, um, I, I'm going to have a list of different websites that um, you'll, you'll want to check out at the end, but Hollinger is the one that we are most familiar with and use often. Um, Gaylord is also an option. Um, and I asked my, so my, um, my supervisor, who's the preservation specialist, I asked her how she knew that this photograph could be humidified. Um, and she said that she just went by the age um, and that it was a more modern print. Um, and so there are reference books um, where you can go to, to find out what type of photographic print you have. Um, and as I said in the, in the, earlier in the presentation, that um, if you're unsure of what the process was to create the photograph that you have, um, you can consult a conservator to help you figure that out. Yeah, I noticed that there is some damage to the photo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you guys ever uh, do photo restoration on some of these, uh, like with Photoshop, or do, would you use something else to eliminate the uh, the damage? Yeah, so we... So we do not do conservation here at the State Archives. Um, we used to have a conservation lab, but that um, that went away several years ago. 
Um, so normally what we would do is um, we would leave it as is so that it would just be together in a box. But if we were to make a digital surrogate of this record, um, we oftentimes, if it's really severe, um, we'll just leave it. But if it's a small tear, we can use Photoshop to um, clean up the image so that it looks good on the digital archives. Maggie, this is Jerry Lenzen. <clears throat> um, question for you re re regarding your, um, your your process. I see you have cited and quoted several national park uh, <laughs> resource uh, references. Do they yeah. run what the what the national archives procedures are? Um, I believe so, but uh, don't quote me on that. Um, I just know that. Um, they they are a good resource um, and we have they have a lot of materials available online for free um, i'm not really sure why <laughs> um, but but we but we do like to use them as a reference so so we would use them as a reference as well yeah if you come across anything that's on the the national parks website for conservation or preservation it is a good reference to use yes thank you mm -hmm. Um, so I have one more example here. Um, this is a scrapbook from uh, from Nancy Evans. So Nancy Evans was the wife of Dan Evans, a former Washington State governor. Um, and there were a lot of problems inherent with this collection. Um, firstly, it's a scrapbook, so it's an oversized record um, requiring a special sized box. Um, the paper that was used to originally create the scrapbook is actually highly acidic. Um, it has photographs mixed with newspapers and other materials. Um, and there's also, we've also come across um, objects that have been ad adhered with a glue that has caused damage as well. Um, so in this situation, we would recommend um, interleaving each page with a buffered tissue paper and then um, separating the pages from the actual cover and putting those in two different boxes. Hmm. Let me see. So these are some of the websites that um, I recommended for how for um, buying archival materials. Uh, I'll give you all a second to sort of screenshot that or write down any of them as you as you wish. Um, and before, I, while you guys are taking down your notes, I just wanted to talk a little bit about mold, um, my favorite subject. <laughs> mold, um, if it is soft and fuzzy, that means that it's active. Um, pow if it's powdery and hard, that means it's inactive. Um, and you can't, you can't ever get rid of mold, you can only make it inactive. Um, you can deactivate mold by um, freezing, um, for, by freezing the document. You have to wrap it in a wax paper, um, and taping it shut to avoid contamination with any other anything else that's in your um, in your freezer. Um, photographs should be interleaved with the wax paper before freezing. Um, you can clean mold that is inactive, I, so it's meaning that it's powdery or hard, using a HEPA vac um, with the nylon over the vacuum tube to prevent um, damage, um, and make sure that it has sort of a burial speed so that you you don't have a high you're not using a high High suction vacuum on a on a sensitive document. Um, also, if you if you do have mold on your documents, you'll want to clean them outdoors or somewhere where you have lots of um, lots of fresh air. Um, and sometimes if they if they have like a soft brush on them, that works too. And if you do have objects that have been exposed to mold, you'll want to make sure that you've cleaned or removed or deactivated the mold before you store it with anything else that has not had mold because mold will find its way to the other records. So you'll want to make sure everything is wiped down. Um, any area where you're going to be storing records should be wiped down with bleach ahead of time. Not your objects, but your 
but like the wherever you're storing it in your closet or somewhere. Um, materials that you can't freeze include ambrotypes, um, tin types, or any sort of wet collodion glass plate negatives. Uh, we had a problem with mold uh, last winter mm -hmm. and uh, did what we could to keep the moisture out of the room, but it, uh, we could definitely smell it Yeah. Uh, in our flat follow room. Uh, could that mold then make its way over to our books? And whatnot Absolutely. There? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if the room is, so you'll, I guess you'll want to maybe put, um, we call it the hydrothermograph, which is like a temperature and relative humidity tracker. Um, if you put one in the room and you find that the relative humidity is really high, especially above 50s, I'd say 56%, um, and, and you know, you're sensing moisture and mold growth in there, that will absolutely um, transfer to your books. Um, you either want to remove the books from the room and try to figure out where the moisture is coming from, um, and then have it cleaned before putting your books back. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sharon Thiesmeyer is not in this uh, meeting. Eric? Oh, let's yeah. Yeah, she's not. Okay, we'll have a chat. Okay. <laughs> uh, so let me see if there's any questions here. Um, Steve had a question. How does one tell if an item is acidic? Um, so you can actually use a pH pen. Um, they're available online and they kind of look like a Sharpie. Um, let's see if I can find it here on the website. <laughs> Um, so you wouldn't necessarily use this on a record, but this we, we like to use the pH pens. Um, well, actually, we have used them on records to see if like the scrap, especially with scrapbooks, if you have like a paper in a scrapbook that might be acidic, you can draw a little line with a pH pen to make sure that it, it's okay for us to leave um, records on there. Um, Yeah, so they're called pH testing pens for paper products. Um, and they're they're usually available on any of the number of sites that I, I gave you a list of. And they're, yeah, they're on Gaylord as well. So they, yeah, they're called the Abbey pH pen. Um, and it tests the pH of the paper, the map board, folders, or envelopes. And simply by putting a tiny mark um, on the object. Purple indicates that it has a pH of seven or above and yellow indicates that it's um, more alkaline when, with a pH below 6.5. So, so that's a good, a good tool to have. Um, you also just know, I mean, newspapers are notoriously highly acidic. So that's one you can always just keep in your wheelhouse is that newspapers are always gonna be really acidic and it's best to just keep them from other types of records. Um, recommendations for photo albums with sticky backgrounds. So are you, t I'm, I, uh, what I'm thinking of is like the magnetic. Um, these were used a lot in the 1980s um, where they have like a sticky backing and you put the photograph on top and then they would have some sort of plastic film over them. Mm -hmm. um, these magnetic media are um, highly acidic and these are pretty much the only type of scrapbook or photo album that we would take apart. We don't normally recommend um, taking scrapbooks apart or photo albums apart because you know that can um, that can take away from the you know the, the intrinsic value of the record and, and understanding you know how who made it and all those things um, and so if you do have magnetic media we have done presentations on this before um, but those are the only ones that we recommend um, taking apart and if you are interested in and having us come back to do a, a presentation on on scrapbooks, I'd be happy to do that because we do have a whole we have a whole lot of information about those in particular. I, you know, as someone who's I, I'm a millennial, so my mom made me scrapbooks made of those or photo albums made with those exact types of books, um, and I have the task now of um, I'm imaging all of them. I'm going to be digitally digitally imaging all of my 
my photo books as they exist now or taking them apart um, in time because um, you know those photographs are all I have. Um, they, I don't have a digital copy of any of them. So um, you'll wanna preserve those as best you can. Um, one more question, um, a wide format World War I photograph of my grandfather's army company at Fort Lewis was originally shipped in a tube, um, no archival, anything around it, and has been stored in that tube for the past century. I'm afraid to unroll it due to potential cracking, should I try? Um, honestly, if, you're, if you have concerns about it cracking, I would leave it in the tube. Um, and if you have the means to consult a conservator or, um, or even a local archive, if you came here um, and wanted to meet with Mary or I, we could, we could sort of give you some advice about it or sort of, um, it, it's possible that it would be fine being rehumidified, but of course, if you're concerned, I wouldn't try it on, on my own. Um, so that's an option as well. Maggie? Yeah. I have a comment. Sure. We get this dry red from Fred Myers, and we put it in the car because that's where our moisture problem is. But yeah. my sister puts it in her closet, and it might be a temporary thing that Steve could use for his dampness problem until he finds out where the moisture is coming from. Yeah, it really I mean, does make a difference. Yeah, any way to reduce moisture is a good option for sure. We were already using that this winter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then you have a problem. Yeah, so I suspect a, a leaky something or something happening over there. Any other questions? Uh, just one thing. Um, it would be highly, you, you would want to use a lot of caution. I used to be a commercial photographer. Uh, hydrating uh, photographs is very risky because if you hit them with too much moisture, uh, the silver nitrate can adhese and you wind up destroying the photograph. Yes. Yes. Um, that's why I say do this, proceed at your, at your own risk. Um, we do use this process here at the archives, but of course, you know, we have a preservation specialist here who knows, um, you know, what is appropriate for this process and what isn't. So like I said before, you'll want to consult with someone ahead of time before, before doing anything like that, especially with photographs. Absolutely. Maggie, I have another suggestion. You were talking about um, the, the sticky back uh, storage books. Yeah. Uh, I have friends at least, and, I, and I've done it a couple of times myself to uh, scan those particular pages with all the images left in, play, in place. Yeah. So you're, you're preserving the images, but you're not serving them. Yeah, so you're preserving the context and how they were originally put together. Yeah, that's that's what we recommend. Thank you very much, Maggie. Welcome. Really interesting presentation.